Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is Unit 4 uh, of the International Advanced Level Chemistry, Pearson at Excel. Uh, this was the paper for January 2023. So let's take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. The first question in this paper says two ways of writing an equation for the reaction between nitrogen monoxide and oxygen are shown. Which pair of rate equations could be correct for this reaction? So he's asking me to write the rate equation for each of these reactions. First of all, you should remember that rate equations include concentrations of reactants, not products. So if he has um, uh, option C and D are writing the um, rate equation with respect to the product. So these, this is wrong. And then you need to remember that the equation has to be a balanced equation. So we need, for example, this equation 2 to be like this, so that it's a balanced equation with no half in it. And then we write the rate equation is equal to K times concentration of each of the reactants to the power of its coefficient. So, for example, equation 1 would be the rate equals K times concentration of NO to the power 2 times concentration of O2 to the power 1. So, my answer is A or B. Now, the second equation, after we balance it so that there is no half in it, then you can uh, say that option A is our, our correct answer because rate would be K times concentration of NO to the power 2 times concentration of O2 to the power 1. So these are the rate equations for these uh, reactions. Okay, the second question says, which two methods can be used for continuous monitoring of the progress of this reaction? So if I want to continuously monitor, not just me measure at the beginning and measure at the end, for example, I want continuous monitoring of the progress of this reaction. So what are the options that I have? I have colorimetry. You remember that colorimetry is when we uh, uh, subject the sample to a ray of monochromatic light. So it's a ray of one uh, light and one wavelength of light. And then we can follow the transmission of this wave through the sample because as the reaction proceeds, the color of reactions would either become darker or uh, lighter. These equations, if you remember, involve NO and NO2, and this is changing in color. So I can use colorimetry. So my answer is A or B. Now, would it be colorimetry and titration or colorimetry and volume change? Remember that titration cannot be used to follow continuously the progress of a reaction but we can use colorimetry or col uh, volume change for continuous monitoring of a reaction the next question says the half-life of a first order chemical reaction is what what is the definition of half-life you should remember that half-life is the time taken for the concentration of a reactant to become half of what it's started with. So that is the definition of half-life. Question 3 says two chemicals, E and F, react to form products G and H. The mechanism for the reaction occurs in two steps via the formation of an intermediate which he calls J. So E plus F to give J is the slow um, step and then it reacts the j reacts with the f to form g and h now what is the rate equation for the reaction remember if we have a mechanism and one of the steps is slow then the rate involves the reactants in the slow step so in this case the slow step involves e and f so my rate would be k times e to the power one 
times a uh, concentration of F to the power one. Which graph shows the entropy of a substance as it changes state from solid to liquid to gas? Remember, as we go from solid to liquid to gas, what happens to the entropy? The entropy is constantly increasing. But at the point where it is increasing from one or changing from one state to another, there is a sharp rise in the entropy. So first of all, I want to choose a graph in which there is rise in entropy as we go along from solid to liquid to gas. So I cannot choose A or B because A has a flat area in solid, flat area in liquid, and flat area in gas. So that is not right. As the solid or liquid or gas, their temperature increases, the entropy increases. So my answer is C or D. But you should remember that the rise in entropy or the increase in entropy going from solid to liquid is less than from liquid to gas. So actually, my answer is D because as we go from solid to liquid melting, there is a rise in entropy. And then as we go along the liquid, the temperature increases, there is rise in entropy. And then when we change from liquid to gas, there is a huge rise in entropy during boiling. So that is the graph for uh, entropy of the change of state. Two flasks P and Q are connected by a tube fitted with a tap. Flask P contains argon gas and flask Q is in vacuum. Assume argon behaves as an ideal gas, so we're talking about ideal gas. Therefore, there has no, uh, it has no intermolecular forces between its atoms. How do the entropy and the energy of the system change when the tap is opened and the argon fills both flasks? So at the beginning, argon is only in P. Now we're going to open the tap so that the argon diffuses into Q and it fills both Q and P. What would happen, first of all, to the entropy of the system? Of course, this is spreading of the particles, so the entropy would increase. So my answer is A or C. What happens to the energy as the gas is uh, diffusing from P to Q, remember that we did not heat the gas, so the energy of the system will actually remain unchanged. So there is increase in entropy because the particles will spread further apart in a more random uh, arrangement, and the energy will remain unchanged since there is no heating or cooling of the flask. When hydrogen and oxygen are mixed in a flask, there is no reaction. When a platinum gauze is added to the flask, the mixture explodes. That means when I add platinum, it's a catalyst. The reaction becomes very fast. It can be deduced that in the absence of a platinum gauze, so in the absence of a catalyst, the mixture of hydrogen and oxygen is what? Okay. First of all, he's asking, is it kinetically stable or unstable? Is it thermodynamically stable or unstable? Now, what is the meaning of each of these? You should remember that kinetically stable or kinetics means how fast the reaction takes place. So is it a fast reaction or a slow reaction? And thermodynamics has to do with whether the reaction can take place or not. So if I look at the energy profile diagram, the kinetics has to do with the activation energy. So it has to do with the catalyst. And the thermodynamics has to do with whether the product is more stable or the reactant is more stable. So here, this reaction, he says, it reacts very quickly only if I add a catalyst. That means it is kinetically stable, but thermodynamically, it is unstable. Okay, the diagram shows the Born-Haber cycle for sodium oxide. Which energy change in the cycle does Y represent? Where is Y? Let's take a look at the Born-Haber cycle. Y is the change from 
O gas and oxygen atom to O2 minus. So that means my oxygen atom gained two electrons. And that means that Y is the first and second electron affinities of oxygen. Remember when we gain the first electron, that is the first uh, electron affinity. Now it's gaining two electrons. So this is the sum of the first and the second electron affinities of oxygen. Which expression gives the enthalpy change of formation of sodium oxide? Where is uh, enthalpy change of formation? What is the enthalpy change of formation? It is the formation of a substance in its standard state from the elements in their standard state. So you're trying to form Na2O solid. From where? From Na solid and O2 gas. So we're going B, W, X, Y, Z, the total of all of that would be the delta H of formation of Na2O. Okay? An ionic compound is found to have some degree of covalent bonding. What will be the cause of the covalency? And how will the lattice energy obtained from a Born-Haber cycle differ from the theoretical value obtained from electrostatic theory? Remember, if we say that we have ionic compound, but it has some degree of covalency, what does that mean? An ionic compound is one in which we have a positive and a negative ion, and there is strong attraction between the positive and negative ion. But if there is a degree of covalency, that means that the um, positive ion will polarize the anion so that the anion, uh, the electron cloud around the anion is slightly polarized by the cation. So the anion is polarized by the cation. And when this happens, in the case of slight degree of covalent bonding, then the bond Haber is more exothermic. So the negative value is a bigger negative value. It's more exothermic than the uh, theoretical value. So remember that when we have some degree of covalency, that means that the negative ion, the anion, has been polarized by the cation. So it, the cation has attracted some of the electron cloud towards it. And in that case, the von Haber uh, lattice energy is more exothermic than the theoretical. The equation for the reaction between iron and steam is shown. What is the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction? How do we write the equilibrium constant expression for a reaction? First of all, this is Kc. Kc is the uh, taking into account the concentrations of product over concentration of react. That's how we write Kc. Concentration of product over concentration of react. But remember, solids are not included in the expression for Kc. So if we look at this equation, the Kc will be the concentration of hydrogen to the power of its coefficient. Over the concentration of water to the power of its coefficient, we do not include the uh, solids in the equation. So that D is my expression. What is the effect on the equilibrium constant for this reaction if small pieces of iron are replaced by iron powder? and if the temperature is increased. So first of all, I have my Kc. This was the expression for Kc. Now, how is this affected if we use iron powder instead of small pieces? Remember that the Kc in that case will be unchanged because the solids are not included in the expression anyway. The difference would be that it will make the equilibrium reach faster. But it will not affect the Kc. Now, 
What about when the temperature is increased? Now, when the temperature, remember that the forward reaction here is exothermic. The delta H is negative. So the forward reaction is exothermic. If I increase the temperature, what happens to the equilibrium? Remember that increasing the temperature causes the equilibrium to shift to the side that is endothermic. And that means in this reaction, if we increase the temperature, the equilibrium shifts to the left or it goes backward. And that means the concentration of hydrogen decreases. And that means the Kc would decrease. Equal amounts of ethanoic acid and methanoic acid are mixed. What are the conjugate acid-base pairs in the mixture? Okay, we have two acids, but one of them has to ionize and the other one has to receive the proton. So one of them has to be a proton donor, the other one will have to be a proton acceptor. Which one will give the proton and which one will accept the proton? That depends on the pKa. So this is the equilibrium uh, expression for the reaction. If I'm writing the Ka, the Ka is the concentration of products over concentration of reactants. Now you should realize pKa of course is minus log K and you should realize that the higher the Ka or lower the pKa, the more acidic. So the one with the Lower pKa is the one that is more acidic. Which one has lower pKa? It's methanoic acid. And that means it is the methanoic acid that will give a proton. And that means the HCOOH would be the acid. When it gives a proton, it becomes HCOO minus. And it is the other one that will accept a proton. So it's the ethanoic acid that accepts a proton. And then it will become a conjugate acid okay so remember the one with the lower pka is the one that is more acidic so it's the one that would be a proton donor one mole uh, the, uh, per decimeter cubed solution of ethanoic acid is gradually diluted by the addition of distilled water so he has ethanoic acid and he is diluting it what happens to the degree of dissociation of the acid and the pH of the solution? So if I'm trying to dilute uh, an acid, remember that the acid is, ethanoic acid is a weak acid, and that means it only partially ionizes, so only some of the ethanoic acid ionizes to give H plus ions. But you should remember that dilution makes it ionize more. So the degree of dissociation as we dilute the solution, the degree of dissociation would increase. More and more of the particles will dissociate. But remember that we are increasing the volume. So overall, the concentration of H plus ions in the solution will become less. So the pH will increase. So remember that dilution increases the degree of dissociation. But if we're talking about the pH, the concentration of H plus ions is now in a bigger volume, so that means lower concentration, and that means higher pH. The solubility of magnesium hydroxide is this at 25 degrees Celsius, and this at 100 degrees Celsius. And he gives me the Kw at 25 and at 100. The question is, what is the pH of a saturated solution of magnesium hydroxide at 25 degrees Celsius? How do we get the pH of a solution of a base? You should know magnesium hydroxide, when it dissociates, one mole of magnesium hydroxide gives two moles of hydroxide ions. So, if we have the Kw, you know that Kw is 10 to the minus 14, and that's what he gives me at 25. So we're talking about 25 degrees Celsius. The Kw is 10 to the minus 14. And Kw is concentration of H plus ions times concentration of OH minus ions. Now, he gives me up there the concentration of the magnesium hydroxide. 
So the concentration of magnesium hydroxide is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4 mole per decimeter cubed. But remember that each mole of magnesium hydroxide gives 2 moles of OH minus. So the, if I'm trying to solve for H plus, H plus is 10 to the minus 14 over 2 times the concentration of magnesium hydroxide. So this gives me the concentration of H plus ions. This is 4.545 times 10 to the minus 11. Now I can get the pH. The pH is minus log of that. So my pH is 10.3. Saturated solutions of magnesium hydroxide at 25 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius are compared. How do the concentrations of hydroxide ions and pH values of these solutions differ? Okay, so we're talking about concentration of hydroxide ions at 100. Remember that if we have solubility, if we talk about solubility of magnesium hydroxide, at a higher temperature, the solubility is higher. So more of the magnesium hydroxide will dissolve at 100 than at 25. We have, that means that at 100, we have more concentration of OH minus. So if he's talking about concentration of hydroxide ions, it will be higher. Because at the higher temperature, more of the solid will dissolve. But then if we say that we have higher concentration of OH minus, then the solution is more alkaline. And that means that the pH would be higher. So my answer is B. Remember, at a higher temperature, solids are more likely to dissolve more. So more of it will dissolve, more of the hydroxide dissolves, higher concentration of hydroxide, that means the pH is high. Propanol has a much higher boiling temperature than butane, even though both compounds have the same molar mass. So if you look at the structure of propanol, that is propanol, it's an aldehyde. Butane, of course, is an alkane. And he's saying that propanol has much higher boiling temperature than butane. Now, what is the reason for that? Why does propanol have higher boiling point? You should remember that propanol has a carbonyl with an electronegative oxygen atom and that means it has permanent dipoles and the molecules will have a permanent dipole permanent dipole interaction and that is stronger than the weak van der Waals forces or London forces that are only present between the butane uh, molecules so the butane has only weak van der Waals forces so that's lower boiling point the propanol has dipoles permanent dipoles so it will have a permanent dipole permanent dipole interaction and that is stronger than the van der waals forces it will need more energy to be broken and that's why it has a higher boiling temperature the structure of an ester is shown which two compounds react to form this ester Remember that an ester is formed between an alcohol and what? It could be an alcohol and an acid or an alcohol and an acid chloride. So my options here are acid chloride. So which part of the ester came from the alcohol and which part came from the uh, acid chloride? Remember the part that has the carbonyl C double bond O was the acid chloride. And the other part was the alcohol. So the acid chloride that I have here is made up of what? Four carbon atoms. So that will be butanoyl chloride, not propanoid. So my answer is A or B. Now, what is the name of that alcohol that we started with? This is an alcohol that has four carbons with uh, one methyl and one uh, OH group that was attached in that part. So that is 3 methyl butane 2O. Can you see that? So the alcohol has four carbons, 
on Corbin. Number two, I have what was the OH, which is now the linkage in the ester. And on Corbin number three, I have a methyl group. Samples of ethanol and propanone are added to separate test tubes containing iodine dissolved in aqueous sodium hydroxide, and the mixtures are heated gently. A pale yellow precipitate will be formed with what? First of all, what are we doing? We're reacting with iodine in aqueous potassium hydroxide. That means that we're looking for a methyl group next to a carbonyl because that is what would react with iodine to give a pale yellow precipitate. So what is he talking about? Ethanol, this is the structure of ethanol. Does it have a methyl group next to a carbonyl? Yes, it does. So this would give me a pale yellow precipitate. Now, what's the other one? Propanone, does it have a methyl group next to a carbonyl? Yes, so both of them would give a pale yellow precipitate. Question 16 says, the chromatogram of a substance X is shown. What is the RF value for substance X? How do we calculate RF values? We measure from the baseline to the spot we're talking about, divided by from the baseline to the solvent front. So the RF value is the distance traveled by the spot over the distance traveled by the solvent. Now, if this in our paper, we can just measure it with a ruler and we can determine what is the RF value exactly. But even if we don't, just looking at it, obviously, the spot is about, what, three quarters of the way up the paper. So the 0.7, that would be my reasonable RF value. If not in the paper, we measure it using a ruler from baseline to spot over from baseline to the solvent front. Okay, question 17 says, the reaction between hydrogen peroxide and iodide ions in acid conditions is known as harcourt essen reaction after the scientists who first studied its kinetics. So we have this equation. A student carried out experiments to determine the rate equations for this reaction at 293K. The rate of this reaction may be obtained by adding a fixed volume of sodium thisulfate solution and a few drops of starch solution to the reaction mixture. Remember we said if we have any reaction that involves iodine, then, for example, this reaction, hydrogen peroxide plus iodide ions, gives iodine. Now, we're going to titrate with sodium thiosulfate with a fixed volume of sodium thiosulfate and a few drops of starch solution. Remember that when we have iodine, we use starch as uh, the indicator. Now, explain how this method is used to measure the rate. So remember that reaction gives iodine. So what we do is the sodium thiosulfate reacts with the iodine formed. Then, when all the thiosulfate has been used up, the iodine reacts with the starch to give a dark blue-black color. So we measure the time taken for the blue-black color to appear, and the rate is 1 over time. Okay? The student's results are shown. So he's trying to repeat the experiment, changing concentrations of the H2O2, the iodide, the H plus ions, and he measures the rate. Deduce the rate equation for this reaction. Remember, when we have this kind of table, we look for two experiments in which um, at least one of them, for example, is constant, and we change the others, and we see what is the effect on the rate. So let's see what is happening. If we look at run two and three. In run two and three, the concentration of H2O2 is constant. The concentration of H plus ions is about constant. Both of these are about 0 0.001. Then we look at what happened to the concentration of iodide. It was doubled from 0.04 to 0 
Now, what happened to the rate when we doubled the iodide? Also, the rate doubled. And we said, if this doubles and this doubles, then that is first order. So, when we explain it, we say, which runs are we talking about? Run 2 and 3. The H2O2, concentration of H2O2 and concentration of H plus are constant. Now, when the concentration of iodide is doubled, the rate is doubled, and that indicates that the reaction is first order with respect to iodide. So now we know it is first order with respect to iodide. So let's take another two runs. So let's say run one and run two. What is happening? We have concentration of H plus ion is constant, so we're not looking at that. And we already know that the concentration of iodide is first order. So if the iodide is doubled, the rate should be doubled. If the uh, iodide is tripled, the rate, and so on, okay? So what happens then to the concentration of H2O2? Now, the concentration of H2O2 went from 0.02 to 0.01. So it was halved. Now, what happened to the rate? The iodide was doubled, but the H2O2 was halved and the rate remained constant. And that means that it is first order with respect to both. So from run one and two, H plus ions is constant. Now what happens? H2O2 is half and the iodide is doubled, the rate remains the same. You know that if the H2O2 is, is uh, half, the rate should be half. But then the iodide is doubled, so the rate is double of that, so the rate did not change. So that indicates that it is first order with respect to both H2O2 and iodide. Okay, then if we look at run 1 and 4, in run 1 and 4, the concentration of H2O2 is constant. Now, what happens to the concentration of iodide? It is quadrupled from 0.02 to 0.08, so that is times 4. The H plus ions are doubled from 0.001 to 0.002, and yet the rate is only quadruple. If the H plus ions had any effect, then we should have more than quadruple. But the iodide quadrupled, the rate quadrupled, and that means the H plus ions have no effect. So that means that when the iodide is quadrupled, the H plus is doubled, the rate is quadrupled, this indicates that the reaction is zero order. With respect to H plus ions, that means concentration of H plus ions do not affect the rate, so it is not included in the rate uh, equation. So remember that this is how we write the rate equation. We say rate is equal to K times. Now, concentration of H2O2 is to the power 1 because it's first order. Uh, concentration of iodide is to power 1 because it's first order. You could say that concentration of H plus ions is to the power zero, but you don't need to write that. So it is zero order with respect to H plus ions, so it may not be included in the rate equation. Calculate the rate constant for this reaction using the results from run one. So let's take a look at run one. This was run one. We can use this. We already deduced the equation for rate. We said the rate is K times concentration of H2O2 times concentration of I minus. So K would be the rate over the concentration of the other two. We get that from the table, and that gives me a value of K, 4.3531. But he wants unit. So how do we get the unit? Remember, the rate is mole per decimeter cubed per second. And you have the uh, units in the table. So rate alone is mole per decimeter cube per second. And the concentration of each of these that are in the denominator are mole per decimeter cubed, mole per decimeter cubed. So this is the uh, expression, but you cancel whatever is the same uh, up and down, and that leaves us with decimeter cubed uh, per mole per second. So you can write it like this. So this would be the unit. K. The student carried out a second series of experiments with this reaction at 313 K, and he says the rate of reaction was found to be 4.45 times 
faster at 313K than at 293K. Calculate the activation energy for this reaction using the Arrhenius equation. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures and include the sign. So this is the equation that we need to use. Natural log of K is minus activation energy over RT plus a constant. And he wants us to calculate activation energy. So when we look at uh, 293, the natural log of K at 293 is minus Ea over Rt plus a constant. The len for K at 313 would be like this. Now he's saying that the rate at 313 is 4.45 times. So if you say the len over of K over this over K over 293, the K at 313 over K at 293, he tells me is 4.45 times. So that means the natural log of 4.45 is equal to this kind of equation. We're trying to um, use both equations. So solving for the EA for the activation energy, the activation energy will become this in joules. And if you want it in kilojoules, then you divide by a thousand. Okay, he says use appropriate number of significant figures and include units. This is kilojoule per mole. And um, three significant figures would be correct. Do you understand what we did? We don't know what is EA and we don't know what is K for each of them, but we do know that the ratio of K at 313 over K at 293 is 4.45. So put the two equations together and solve for activation energy. This would give this number of kilojoules per mole. Lactic acid is formed in muscles. And in sour milk, lactic acid may be obtained from ethanol in the laboratory by the two-step synthesis shown. So he has the aldehyde, he, adds, uh, he reacts it with cyanide, so we add an extra carbon, and then we hydrolyze the cyanide to get an acid with uh, um, the alcohol part still intact. Okay, explain why lactic acid formed in muscles is optically active. While lactic acid obtained using the laboratory synthesis is not. You should define any terms you use. So what is he talking about? Lactic acid is this. But then lactic acid has a chiral carbon. Do you remember what a chiral center is? A chiral center is a carbon with four different groups. So that carbon in the middle has a bond to H, a bond to CH3, a bond to OH, and a bond to the uh, acid group COOH. This kind of molecules that have a chiral center can be optically active because they will have optical isomers. So I can have a mirror image of this molecule that is non-superimposable. So remember that we need to define any terms we use. So lactic acid has a chiral center. A chiral center is a carbon atom bonded to four different groups. Now, this can form two forms that are non-superimposable mirror images. This is called enantiomer, so it forms a pair of enantiomers. When we have something that has a pair of enantiomers, the difference between them is that each of them will rotate the plane of polarized light in opposite direction. Now, the lactic acid formed in the muscles contains only one of these. So it is optically active and rotates the plane of polarized light in one direction. So in the muscles, the reaction forms only one of these. Each of these rotates plane polarized light in opposite direction. So if I have only one of them, then the substance is optically active. It will rotate the plane of polarized light in one of these directions. 
but he's saying that the one in the laboratory synthesis does not rotate the plane of polarized light. This would be because the carbonyl group is planar. So when it reacts with the cyanide, the cyanide can be added from either side. And that means that I will end up with uh, equal amounts of both enantiomers. This is called a racemic mixture. So when I can have both of them, both forms uh, of the optically active uh, products, these are called enantiomers, and the mixture of equal amounts of enantiomers is a racemic mixture. So in that case, they will not rotate the plane of polarized light because I have equal amounts. One of them rotates one direction, the other rotates in the opposite direction. So overall, there will be no rotation. So we say it is optically inactive. It will not uh, rotate the plane of polarized light. Polylactic acid is a polyester derived from lactic acid as the only monomer. What was lactic acid? This is lactic acid. And the idea is, if I want to form a polymer, I need one side to have acid and the other side to have alcohol. But this molecule in itself has both. So I can have one side acid, one side alcohol. Now, this we do condensation, polymerization. If I have two of them, we need, or many of them, the OH of one will attach to the acid of the previous one. And this will form polylactic acid. So if I'm trying to draw the repeat units, remember this is uh, something that has acid on one end. So I'm going to remove the OH of the acid, join to the next molecule. And that next molecule, I remove the H of the alcohol. So removing OH from the acid and H from the alcohol, and I join in the middle. That's an ester linkage. Now, the alcohol on the other end also, I will remove the H to join to a previous molecule. The acid on the right, I will also remove the OH to join to another molecule, and this forms the polymer. So I have many units of these, and I write N to indicate that there are a long chain of this repeated unit. Do we understand this? So this is just condensation, polymerization, remove the OH from the acid, H from the alcohol, and join. Lactic acid is converted into compound X, which is then polymerized to form uh, polylactic acid. The empirical formula of X so we don't know what is X now. We're trying to get what is X. He's telling me that it has an empirical formula, C3H4O2. And its molar mass is 144. So what is the molecular formula? How do I get molecular formula from empirical formula? If we know the empirical formula, C3H4O2, the first thing is I calculate the MR of the empirical formula, three carbons, four hydrogens, uh, two oxygens, this gives an MR of 72. But he's telling me that the molecular mass is 144. So 144 has how many 72s? That's twice 72. And that means the actual molecular formula is twice of that. So it is C6HA04. A simplified high-resolution proton NMR of X is shown. So we're still talking about X. Now we know its molecular formula. We're looking at its proton NMR spectrum. The numbers above the peaks are the relative peak areas. Note that the chemical shifts for X are different from the general values in the data booklet. So we don't look at the uh, chemical shifts. Let's take a look at how many protons and what is the splitting. So state what the number of peaks, the relative peak areas, and the splitting patterns show about the structure of X. Okay, what do we have? We have a doublet with three hydrogens, and we have a quartet with one hydrogen. So that means, first of all, I have two proton environments. I have a doublet that contains three times as many protons as the neighboring carbon. And the neighboring carbon 
forms a quartet because the previous the other carbon on the other end has three hydrogen. The two proton environments are on adjacent carbon atoms. So this is what my proton NMR tells me. Now, he says there is a carbon-13 NMR, and this is the carbon-13 NMR of X. State what additional information about the structure of X is given by the spectrum. Well, looking at the spectrum, obviously, first of all, I have three carbon environments. Now, does it tell me anything about the functional group? So if I look at the data booklet, I have a peak at about 180, uh, one, around 180. That peak is probably due to, remember, it's due to an ester or an amide, but we don't have nitrogen in our molecule. So that peak must be due to an ester. So we probably have, or most probably have an ester uh, group. So from all of these, he's saying draw the structure of X. Well, so far, what do we know about X? Molecular formula is C6H8O4. That means it has six carbons. It contains an ester group. It has two proton environments. And it has three carbon environments. Three carbon environments with C6, that means that three of them are similar to the other three. And it must involve ester groups, and it has only two proton environments for the eight hydrogens that we have. That means the structure probably looks something like this. So this, these have ester linkages. It has three carbon environments, CH3C with C double bond O. And on the other end, it's the same, CH3C and the C double bond O. And we have two proton environments because we have one at the CH3. So this is the one that was a uh, doublet in the uh, proton NMR. And we have a carbon that has one hydrogen, but it has three neighboring hydrogens. So that was the one that was a quartet. Okay. Carbonyl compounds are usually reduced in the laboratory using complex metal hydrides such as lithium tetrahydrido aluminate, lithium aluminum hydride, lithium aluminum hydride. The metal hydrides react by supplying hydride ions, which then react with the carbonyl group to form an intermediate. The addition of a strong acid in aqueous solution to the intermediate produces the reaction product. First of all, state the essential conditions for using the lithium aluminum hydride. Okay, if you remember, lithium aluminum hydride is something that can be used to convert a carbonyl group to an alcohol. So it reduces the carbonyl group. What are the conditions for the use of that? It should be in dry ether. Complete the mechanism for the reduction of propanone with the lithium aluminum hydride, showing the structure of the intermediate and the final product. Include curly arrows, relevant lone pairs, dipoles. So we have propanone, and you should realize that propanone has carbon slightly positive, oxygen slightly negative, since the oxygen is electronegative atom. Uh, the hydride will attack the slightly positive carbon and the electrons of the double bond will go to the slightly negative oxygen so this is my intermediate okay now the intermediate oxygen has extra lone pair of electrons so this will be used to attack the acid remember he says we add acid to form the product so this is the product formation of the alcohol Explain why lithium aluminum hydride reduces carbonyl compound, but not alkenes, even though both types of compounds have pi bonds. Okay, alkenes have a pi bond, but alkenes do not uh, have dipoles. So the C double bond C is nonpolar, but the carbonyls like aldehydes or ketones.
have a dipole since the oxygen is electronegative so the hydride ion will attack the slightly positive carbon of the carbony the next question says cracking reactions are used to obtain more useful compounds from the alkanes found in crude oil an equation for the cracking of butane is shown thermodynamic data for the compounds in this reaction are given so he gives me the molar entropy of each of these species and the delta h of formation calculate the entropy change in the system for the cracking of butane include sine and u how do we calculate delta s system the change in entropy of the system is the difference between the entropy of products minus entropy of reactants. So from the table, we have the entropy of the product minus the entropy of the reactant, and that gives me a delta S system for uh, this reaction of plus 138.9. Now, units, the units are joule per uh, Kelvin per mole. So this is the unit for entropy. Calculate the entropy change of reaction for the cracking of butane. Include a sign and units with your answer. So he wants the entropy for the reaction we we're talking about. We have from the table the delta H of formation of each of these species. So we're going to use the delta H of formation. To get the delta H of the reaction. So, looking at the equation like this, formation of C4H10 plus the delta H of the reaction we're looking for is equal to the formation of the product. So, looking at this, um, going one way and going the other, these are equal. So, to get delta H, the delta H is overall plus. 94.0 kilojoule per mole. Calculate the entropy change in the surroundings. How do we get delta S surroundings at 298? You should know that delta S surroundings is minus delta H over T. We already got the delta H over the temperature. He wants 298. This gives delta S of the surroundings of this number, minus 315.44. He says include a sign, of course, this is from the equation, delta S surroundings is minus delta H over T, and our delta H was a positive sign, so the overall delta S surroundings is negative. Calculate the total entropy change at 298. So the total entropy change is the delta S of the system plus the delta S of the surroundings. We already got the delta S of the system from the first part of the question, and we got the delta S of the surroundings. Adding them up, we get the delta S total. So overall, our delta S total is a negative number, and the units for entropy joule per mole per degree Kelvin. Calculate the temperature at which the cracking reaction becomes feasible. Now, how do we do that? You should know that the delta S total is delta S system plus delta S surroundings. And the reaction is feasible if the delta S total is zero or above. Remember that? A reaction is feasible if the delta S total is positive. So the minimum temperature would be the one when the delta s total is zero so we look at the numbers that we have if delta s system minus delta h over t is zero then the delta s system is equal to delta h over t solving for t we find that the temperature at which the reaction is feasible is 676.7 uh kelvin 5 mole of butane is cracked at 750 Kelvin. At equilibrium, 4.45 mole of ethene is formed. And the total pressure is 1.2 atm. First of all, give the expression for Kp. 
So how do we write the expression for Kp? Remember that Kp is the partial pressure of products over the partial pressure of reactants. So this would be the expression for Kp. Calculate the value of Kp, including units, if required. So what do we know? We know that we have 5 mole of butane. They are cracked at equilibrium. We end up with 4.45 mole of ethene. And the total pressure is 1.2. So how do we calculate Kp? We look at the equation and we do what we call the ice chart. So initially, I have 5 mole of butane and I don't have any of the others. The change would be that part of this 5 mole will dissociate to give x of each of the products. And that means if x is 4.45, then I can calculate the number of moles at equilibrium. So the total number of moles is 8.45. Then we calculate the partial pressure of each one. What is the partial pressure of each of them, it will be the number of moles over the total times the total pressure. So calculate this for each of these. We get the partial pressure of each one. Put it into the expression for Kp. We end up with a value of 4.57. Now, remember that we have for each of these partial pressures, the unit is ATM. So I end up with ATM to the power 2 over ATM. So I end up with the unit ATM. This question says gluconic acid is a weak acid which occurs in fruit and honey and is widely used as a food additive. And he gives me the structure of gluconic acid. A solution of gluconic acid was prepared by dissolving 4.75 grams of the solid in water, making the solution up to 250 centimeter cubed in a volumetric flask. Write the equation for the acid dissociation constant of gluconic acid. Use RCOOH for gluconic acid. Remember that when we have, it's a weak acid, so part of it will dissociate to give the RCOO minus plus H plus. So writing the Ka, the Ka is concentration of products over concentration of the acid. So this is the expression for Ka. A solution of gluconic acid was prepared by dissolving. This is what he said before, 4.75 grams of the solid in water and making the solution up to 250. So now he's telling me, calculate the pH of the solution. And he gives me the molecular mass of gluconic acid and the Ka for gluconic acid. How do we calculate pH? Remember that he has 4.75 grams of solid, so I get the number of moles of the solid. And then... He put it in 250, so I can calculate the concentration. So if this number of moles in 250 centimeter cube, that's 0 0.250 decimeter cube. So this is my concentration of the solution. Now, what are we trying to get? We're trying to get pH. Well, we're going to get that from the Ka because I want pH means I want concentration of H plus I. So the Ka, we already wrote, this is the expression for Ka. And we know that the acid, when it dissociates, the Ka is given and the concentration of the products are equal. So that means it will be as if it is concentration of H plus to the power 2 over the concentration of the acid that we calculated. We can then solve for concentration of H plus ions, it will be the square root of these. So we end up with this concentration of H plus ion. But he wants pH. How do we get pH? It's minus log the concentration. So this gives me a pH of 2.44. A solution of 0.105 mole per decimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide 
was titrated against 25 centimeter cubed of gluconic acid that was prepared in A. And this is the titration curve. And then he says, explain why phenol red is an appropriate indicator for this titration. Refer to the titration curves and the data booklet. Now, if you look at the data booklet, one of the things included in the data booklet is the list of indicators and their pH range. Now, he's saying phenol red. Where is phenol red? It says phenol red uh, changes color within 6.8 to 8.4. This is the pH range that we need. If you look at the titration curve, obviously the solution becomes um, at equivalence point at about the pH of 6.8 to 8 point something. So this is within the range of phenol red. So we say that the pH range of phenol red is 6.8 to 8.4, and the titration curve indicates that. This is where we have a sharp rise in pH. So this is a good indicator for this titration. Calculate the pH of the titration mixture after the addition of 35 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide. So if we look at the equation, at what he tells me, he says a solution of 0.105 mole per decimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide was titrated against the 25 centimeter cubed of gluconic acid. So I can get the number of moles of the acid, concentration times volume. And that means that I can get the number of moles of sodium hydroxide needed. It is the same from the equation. And that means I can get the volume of the sodium hydroxide. Volume is number of moles over concentration. So this is the volume of sodium hydroxide needed. But then he added 35 centimeter cubed. So that is much more than the 23 centimeter cubed that we need. So I can calculate the excess sodium hydroxide. That is the concentration of OH minus. I can get the excess number of moles of sodium hydroxide. The concentration is the number of moles over the total volume. Are we paying attention? So that gives me the concentration of OH minus. I can get the POH minus log of that. And that means the pH is 14 minus that. And that gives a pH of 12.3. Mixtures of gluconic acid and sodium gluconate are buffers. Explain how a solution that contains both gluconic acid and sodium gluconate acts as a buffer. Now, let's try and remember what do we mean by buffers. Remember that buffers are solutions that resist a change in pH when small amounts of an acid or base are added to them. So buffers are usually a mixture of acid and its conjugate base. So a buffer is made up of both of these solutions. It will contain a high concentration of both the acid and its conjugate base. This is the equilibrium that we have. And what happens is the equilibrium will either go to the right or to the left in order to keep the concentration of H plus ions uh, constant. When some acid is added, so we're adding H plus ions to this uh, mixture, then the position of equilibrium will shift to the left in order to use up this excess H plus ions. When the OH minus ions are added, so some base is added to this, then the OH minus will react with the H plus, so it's taking some or using up some of the H plus ions, so the equilibrium will shift to the right to uh, make more H plus ions to return to the equilibrium uh, concentration. And that means overall the concentration of acid and concentration of conjugate base will not change and the pH will not change to any extent. The concentration of a solution of gluconic acid is this. Calculate the number of moles of sodium gluconate that must be added 
to one decimeter cubed of this solution to give a buffer with pH 3.71. So we have a certain solution of gluconic acid. I need to add sodium gluconate so that the overall pH is 3.71. He gives me the Ka for gluconic acid. So I can use this equation, pH is equal to pKa plus log concentration of A minus over concentration of HA. So I need the uh, pKa. He already gives me the Ka for the gluconic acid. So I get the pKa, that's minus log of that Ka that he gives me. So now I have the pKa. And I can put that into the equation. He says he wants the pH to be 3.71. I have the pKa. And I have log of concentration of the uh, sodium gluconate over concentration of gluconic acid. He already gives me the concentration of the gluconic acid. I can solve this equation for concentration of A minus. So rearrange the equation get the log of that the inverse log will give me the a minus so solving for the concentration of a minus it gives me 1.097 this is concentration so this is mole per decimeter cubed and this is what he's asking for he's saying calculate the number of moles in one decimeter cubed so the number of moles would be 1.097 7 mole in the 1 decimeter cube. And that's the end of this paper. Um, I hope this was useful. Thank you for listening. Please share the video and uh, keep listening. Thank you.